catapult party out woods. Turn. Catapult party. Rest on. I now invite Air Chief Marshal Mark Binskin AC, the Australian Chief of Defence Force, to deliver the call to remembrance. We gather here at this time on this now quiet beach to remember and honour those who came from across the world to take their place on this battlefield. 100 years ago today, the quiet stillness of dawn and the gentle sound of the waves of this beach gave way to the flash and roar of gunfire over the painful cries of the wounded. For so many, the rising sun that day would be their last. Each man who landed on these shores harboured his own fears and apprehensions. They worried how they would perform when they confronted the enemy and hoped that when the time came, they would not let their mates down. Thoughts also turned to home and the loved ones that they hoped to return to. Lance Corporal Mitchell, a member of the 3rd Brigade Australian Imperial Force, was one man amongst the first group of Anzacs to land here on the peninsula. As his boat neared the shore, Lance Corporal Mitchell recorded the moment. Keen biting breeze sprang up in our faces and we were cold. My breath came deep. I tr tried to analyse my feelings but could not. I think that every emotion was mixed, exultation predominating. We came from the new world for the conquest of the old. The price of failure we knew to be annihilation. Victory might mean life. But even so, whispered jests round, and I remember turning to poor old Peter and asking him how he felt. Good, was his reply. The optimism did not last. The boats had never even reached the shore before the Turkish defenders opened fire. Lance Corporal Mitchell continued. The lead came in squalls, whispering when it came close and whistling when not, smashing into the woodwork of the boats and splashing into the water. The key was being turned in the lock of the lid of hell. The Anzacs stormed the ridges behind you in a hail of fire. Those who could continued upwards towards the guns which did not cease again for eight long months, but for a brief truce to bury the dead. Lance Corporal Mitchell survived Gallipoli, but many of his mates did not. Today, we honour all those Australians and New Zealand soldiers who landed at Gallipoli, especially those who gave their lives in the service of our countries. We remember that all those who served in the Great War left behind a life and a family, setting aside their fears to answer the nation's call to arms. It's our promise to remember them always, and it is right that we do it at this time, on this day, at this place. This is where the Anzac legend was born at great cost. 
Here, the reality of war was revealed. Here, so many dreams, dreams that died with them. Here, they lie in sacred soil. Here, we honour their spirit, the spirit of Anzac, which lives amongst us. And here, we will remember them. Our first commemorative address will be delivered by the Right Honourable John Key, Prime Minister of New Zealand. On this speech, on this day, at this hour, exactly 100 years ago, the first Anzac troops came ashore. Instead of the open spaces that had been described to them, they landed here with steep hills rising in front of this narrow beach. And in those hills, Ottoman Turkish soldiers were already positioned and ready to defend this land. We New Zealanders really think of ourselves as anyone's enemy or as aggressors. But that's exactly how those soldiers would have seen the Anzac and other allied troops on April 25th, 1915. And in the grinding months of fighting that followed. We have coastlines similar to this at home. If for a moment we imagine the situation reversed, we know that New Zealand soldiers would have been willing to lay down their lives to defend their country. So of course were the Ottoman Turks. Time and perspective of history have cast the Gallipoli campaign and some of the military decisions that were made in a different light. But 100 years ago, both sides were doing what they believed was right and what they believed was necessary. There was something else the Anzac troops landing here at Gallipoli did not know as they first struggled onto this foreign soil. It was that their bravery and unity would help to forge the Anzac bond and reputation that endures to this day. I salute that, as I do the bravery of the troops who opposed them and all that have fought on this peninsula. The campaign waged here ensured that the name of this place would be written into the histories of New Zealand, Australia, Britain, Turkey, and the many other countries that fought here, never to be erased. Since then, New Zealanders have fought on many other battlegrounds with similar courage and tenacity. Everywhere a New Zealander has died, serving our country as part of our history. As the centenary of the First World War progresses, we will remember many battles in many different places. But here today, on this special anniversary, we remember Gallipoli. The very name is evocative. Gallipoli to us Kiwis means not only the sea, this beach, these cliffs, and the narrows across the hills. It means the names and stories of more than 2,700 New Zealanders who died here, and the parents, the wives and families who grieved for them, and the family and friends who said goodbye and didn't know it would be forever. To us, Gallipoli is also a byword for the best characteristics of Australians and New Zealanders especially when they work side by side in the face of adversity. 
Gallipoli symbolizes to the pity of war, because while this was a place of courage and heroism and duty, it was also a place of fear and waste and loss. It was a place where soldiers lived in a jumble of trenches, sometimes just meters apart from the opposing side and constantly under fire. It was a place of unspeakable suffering on both sides of the fighting. The generosity of Turkey in welcoming us back here year after year means that Gallipoli also symbolizes the healing power of time, forgiveness and diplomacy. We are grateful to the Turkish people and the Turkish government. Each year, our hosts accommodate and assist the many Australians and New Zealanders who come to see with their own eyes a special place in our country's history. Often it is a special place in their family's history too, where a great grandfather or a great uncle served. They come to see what he saw with his own eyes a hundred years ago, looking up from this very beach. Usually at these commemorations, we conclude by saying, lest we forget. But today, witnessed by all of you who have gathered here out of respect and remembrance, I will not say, lest we forget. Because after 100 years, we can say, on this day, April the 25th, 2015, we remember. The Turkish forces who opposed the Anzacs at Gallipoli were led by Mustafa Kemal, who, as Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, was the founder of modern Turkey and became the first president of the Republic of Turkey. I now invite Captain Itla Ansolo of the Turkish Army, who will first read in Turkish, then in English, this remarkable tribute paid to the Anzacs in 1934 by President Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Yüzbaşı Enis oldu. Değerli konuklar, şimdi sizlere modern Türkiye Cumhuriyeti'nin kurucusu ve Çanakkale kahramanı Mustafa Kemal Atatürk'ün Anzak annelerine hitaben göndermiş olduğu duygu dolu ve çok önemli mesajlar içeren mektubunu okuyacağım. Bu memleketin toprakları üzerinde kanlarını döken kahramanlar Burada bir dost vatanın toprağındasınız. Huzur ve sükun içinde uyuyunuz. Sizler Mehmetçiklerle yan yana koyun koyunasınız. Uzak diyarlardan evlatlarını harbe gönderen analar, gözyaşlarınızı dindiriniz. Evlatlarınız bizim bağrımızdadır. Huzur içinde diller ve huzur içinde Rahat rahat uyuyacaklardır. Onlar bu toprakta canlarını verdikten sonra artık bizim evlatlarımız olmuşlardır. Distinguished guests, now I would like to read the letter, including full of sense and special messages sent to be addressed to Anzac mothers by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, founder of modern Turkish Republic and the hero of Çanakkale. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives. You are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us. There they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having 
lost their lives on this land, they have become our, our sons as well. Thank you. Please stand and join the St. Joseph's Gregory Terrace and All Hallows Gallipoli Choir in the singing of the hymn, God of Our Fathers. Please be seated. Our second commemorative address will be delivered by the Honourable Tony Abbott MP, Prime Minister of Australia. It's 100 years since Australians and New Zealanders splashed out of the sea right here. So now we gather in the cold and dark before dawn, wondering what to say and how to honour those whose bones rest in the hills and in the valleys above us and whose spirit has moved our people for a century. Year after year, we journey to what's now a peaceful coast to remember things that normally we might try to forget. Year after year, from all over our country, from every walk of life, from every background, young and old, make this pilgrimage. We aren't here to mourn a defeat or to honour success although there was much to mourn and much to honour in this campaign. We aren't here to acknowledge a legacy in this country, although Gallipoli shaped modern Turkey as much as it forged modern Australia and New Zealand. Few of us can recall the detail, 
but we have imbibed what matters most, that a generation of young Australians rallied to serve our country when our country called, and they were faithful even unto death. Beginning here, on this spot and at this hour, 100 years ago, they fought, and all too often they died. For their mates, for our country, for their king, and ultimately for the ideal that people and nations should be free. The first Anzacs were tradesmen, clerks, labourers, farmers and professionals. They were from every conceivable occupation, from every rung in the ladder of society, and from every point under the Southern Cross. Instead of landing here, they would have longed for the homes they'd left behind, the times they might have shared with their families, the backyard sport they could have played with their mates. But ordinary men did extraordinary things. They lived with death and dined with disease because that was where their duty lay. In volunteering to serve, they became more than soldiers. They became the founding heroes of modern Australia. If they had not been emblematic of the nation we thought we were, Anzac Day would not have been commemorated from that time until this, in every part of our country, in every place where Australians gather, and in every military base where Australians serve. If they were not still emblematic of the nation we think we are, none of us would be here. But like every generation since, we are here on Gallipoli because we believe that the Anzacs represented Australians at our best. It's the perseverance of those who scaled the cliffs under a rain of fire. It's the compassion of the nurses who attended to the thousands of wounded. It's the conquest of fear, often through a larrikin sense of humour. And it's the greatest love anyone can have, the readiness to lay down your life for your friend. It's this that's ennobled those Anzacs to all who have come after them. They faced the hardest possible test and they did not flinch. The Gallipoli campaign was a failure, of course. The only really successful part was the evacuation. But the survivors of Gallipoli and their reinforcements went on to become some of the world's finest soldiers. The Australian and New Zealand Mounted Infantry spearheaded the British Army that captured Jerusalem and Damascus. In March 1918, it was the Australian Army Corps that held the last great German attack that had split the British from the French armies. And it was Monash, the engineering genius and citizen soldier the commander who'd struggled at Gallipoli but succeeded in France, who pioneered the all-arms warfare that led to victory by breaking the bloody stalemate on the Western Front. Over the past century, the Anzac's descendants have honoured that tradition. In the Second World War, Korea, Malaya, Borneo, Vietnam, Iraq, and our longest war, Afghanistan. Those serving on peacekeeping and relief missions have likewise kept faith with the original Anzacs. Even now, our armed forces are serving in the Middle East and elsewhere, defending the values that we hold dear. 
today, all of us who have not been tested in war. Salute all of those who have. Most of us have never worn our country's uniform. We have not climbed the steep cliffs of Gallipoli. We have not trudged through the snow of Bullecourt. We have not struggled through the, through the mud of Passchendaele. We have not experienced the horrors of Hellfire Pass or fought through the jungles of Kokoda or Vietnam or shaken the Aurasgan sand from our clothes. We have not risked being shot out of the skies over Germany or torpedoed in the Med or the Pacific. But we are the better for those who have. Because they rose to their challenges, we believe that it's a little easier for us to rise to ours. Their example, we believe, helps us to be better than we would otherwise be. That's why we're here, to acknowledge what they have done for us and what they still do for us. The official historian, Charles Bean, said of the original Anzacs, their story rises, as it will always rise, above the mists of ages, a monument to great-hearted men and, for their nation, a possession forever. Yes, they are us. And when we strive enough for the right things, we can be more like them. So much has changed in 100 years, but not the things that really matter. Duty, selflessness, moral courage, always these remain the mark of a decent human being. They did their duty. Now let us do ours. They gave us an example. Now let us be worthy of it. They were as good as they could be in their time. Now let us be as good as we can be in ours. I now invite His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales to deliver a reading. I suspect that many of those here today may be of my own generation, born some 30 years after the end of the First World War, and whose grandfathers and great uncles may easily have fought or lost their lives in this most bloody of campaigns. When I was young, I remember talking to the then Field Marshal Lord Slim about his recollections of the battles in which he was ultimately badly wounded. But when the Anzacs finally left this place, they were tormented by the thought of leaving their comrades behind, that their suffering and loss would be forgotten, that their graves would lie untended. Lieutenant Ken Miller of the 2nd Battalion wrote, there was the question of our dead mates. We lived at Gallipoli with our dead alongside us. Owing to the lack of space, our, com our cemeteries were always under our eyes. The hardest feature of the evacuation was in leaving those dead comrades behind. They had bequeathed us a sacred trust as the party stole away 
from the line, they took off their hats, passing the crosses. And old, hard-bitten Anzacs wept silent tears. They did indeed bequeath us a sacred trust, a trust we honor today. Company Quartermaster Sergeant Benjamin Lean of the 10th Battalion was one of, it, of six brothers, five of whom served in the First World War. He wrote his diary in the form of letters to his wife. On the night before the landing, he wrote, in case the worst happens and I am unable to make any more entries. I will take this opportunity to bid you goodbye, dear girl. I trust that I will come through all right, but it is impossible to say that I must do my duty whatever it is. But if I am to die, know that I died loving you with my whole heart and soul, dearest wife that a man ever had. Kiss little Gwen and our new baby, who perhaps I may never see, and never let them forget Daddy. And you, dear girl, I would love to write you a long goodbye letter, but I must do my work and there is no time. But I love you dearly, my own Phyllis, and I trust that you will always love me. But remember, dear, that if I am killed, I wish you to do absolutely as you think advisable for your future. One little word for mother, dear. Bear with her and be good to her in her few remaining years, for I know she loves me dearly. And tell her that I am not afraid to die, nor am I afraid of what is to come after death. Just tell her, I know in whom I have believed. And now, dear, dear sweetheart, goodbye, goodbye. Benjamin Lee never held his new baby. He survived Gallipoli and was promoted to major, only to die in France in 1917. Here today we remember his sacrifice and that of all those who served and suffered in this faraway place on the other side of the world from the Antipodes. Reverend Monsignor Glyn Murphy, OAM, the Director General Chaplaincy of the Australian Army, and Chaplain Lance Lucan, the Principal Chaplain of the New Zealand Defence Force, will now lead us in the Prayer of Remembrance and the Lord's Prayer. God of love, origin of life, we remember across a century of time in our world and hold in prayer before your eternal presence this dawn, the first Anzacs of Australia and New Zealand who gave all in service and sacrifice upon these shores, valleys and hills. Their graves mark the grief of and loss to their family, friends and nations who kept vigil far from these shores. We remember too all who served and eventually returned home with the burden of war upon their hearts and souls. 
We remember all who have suffered the horrors of war in our world. In your spiritual dawn of eternal life, may they have true peace, everlasting love, and live on forever young with you. We pray that future generations of pilgrims to this cove will always remember the youth, loyalty, bravery, love, service before self, and sacrifice for others that mark the Anzacs of a century past. This we pray through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so together we pray the prayer prayed by our Lord, the prayer which brought comfort to so many who lived and died on these beaches and in these hills a hundred years ago. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Wreaths will now be laid by official representatives. The first wreath will be laid by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. To acknowledge the bond between Australia and New Zealand and the significance of the Anzac tradition, the next wreath will be laid jointly by the Honourable Tony Abbott MP, Prime Minister of Australia, on behalf of the Government and the people of Australia, and the Right Honourable John Key, Prime Minister of New Zealand, on behalf of the Government and the people of New Zealand. The next wreath will be laid by His Excellency, Mr. Volkan Boskia, Minister for European Affair, Union Affairs, on behalf of the government and the people of the Republic of Turkey.
on behalf of Ireland, the French Republic and Canada. His Excellency Mr Michael Higgins, President of Ireland, Mr Jean-Yves Le Drian and the Honourable Lynn Yelich. On behalf of the Republic of Nepal, the Republic of India, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and the Hellenic Republic of Greece, Dr. Narayan Kadka, His Excellency Mr. Vijay Kumar Singh, the Right Honourable Philip Hammond MP, and Mr. Konstantinos Iraklis Iskos. On behalf of the Federal Republic of Germany, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Hungary and the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Mr Marcus Grubel, Dr Yusuf Junaid, Mr Balas Heinrich and Brigadier General Mustafa Ahmed Saqib. On behalf of the Defence Forces of Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, Air Chief Marshal Mark Binskin AC, Lieutenant General Tim Keating MNZM and General Sir Nicholas Horton GCB, CBE, ADC. The final reads will be laid on behalf of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, all veterans of Australia and New Zealand, and war widows and the families left behind, by Air Chief Marshal Sir Joe French, KCB, CBE, Vice Chairman of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, Rear Admiral Ken Doolan, AORAN, the National President of the Returned and Services League of Australia, Mr Barry Clark, President of the Royal New Zealand Returned Services Association, and Mrs Nikki Aldred, 
whose husband served here during the Gallipoli campaign. It is now time to reflect and to silently remember all those who have served and died in war. Please stand for the ode, which will be followed by the last post, one minute silence and revalley. The ode will be recited by Lieutenant General Tim Keating, MNZM, the New Zealand Chief of Defence Force. They went with songs to the battle, they were young. Straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fa fell with their faces to the foe. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget.
Please remain standing for the national anthems of Turkey, Australia and New Zealand. 